You're listening to Journaling with PT. I am your host, artist PT Russell. This is a podcast that highlights creative voices and emerging artists from all over the world. Today, I have a treat for you. Filmmaker Sam Borowski is joining me again, and this time as co-host, as we predict the Oscars. Please, enjoy. Hello, everyone. Today, filmmaker Sam Borowski joins me as co-host, and together we will give our predictions for the 96th Annual Academy Awards, which will be held this coming Sunday, March 10th. It is a pleasure to have you back, Sam. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be back, PT. I really enjoyed last time. And uh, looking forward to this one, because I look forward to the awards every year as a filmmaker. Um, and as someone who qualified a short film a number of years ago, not just two or three, uh, and that kind of kicked me off in the industry. Uh, and as a screenwriter, I always pay attention to the short, the live action short films and both of the screenplay awards, best original and best adapted. But just as a filmmaker, I love the whole, you know, honoring the industry's best and, uh, and obviously some people will disagree and say, well, I think this was better and that's what this is all about. That's why we're talking right. about it. Uh, I will say one thing. I watch it, <coughs> excuse me, for the awards benefit. I don't talk politics. I'm not a politician. I'm not a political person. I could care less about that. Yeah. And I think that it's for it's about the awards. It's about the filmmakers. It's about the actors and the art directors and uh now they're going to start honoring the casting directors. That's what it's yeah. about. And that's, that's what awesome. it should be about. Awesome. And uh, if it stays about that, I think you're going to see the Oscar ratings go up and up and up. That'll be great. <laughs> that will be great. So we're going to start uh, with the acting category and more specifically, best actor, best actress, which we do for Sam. So let's do best actor as we, okay. as we, and I want to say a quick statement to get to the Oscar level. I mean, you're not only the best of the best, you're making studio movies or major indies that get lucky enough to be nominated. It takes such hard work to get to that level. And that's why when I hear uh, some actors, um, you know, that I meet and they're not serious people and they say, I'm going to win an Oscar. It's like, do you even know what it takes uh, to get, it takes a lot to get to that level. And you know, I do a class, you've talked to Kevin. Yes. I've got serious actors. And and I mentioned Alex to you the last time, Alexandra. Yes. Get, we just saw her in a play. That girl's got talent. Kevin's got talent. Those are the type of people, but they still have to work hard. They still have to, I believe you make your own luck. But I've heard people, not them, other people say, oh, I'm going to win an Oscar. And they don't even have a clue what it takes to get to this level. Um you know, uh, I think part of the beauty of actors like Kevin and Alex is I don't think they would they would consider themselves, but they do have that kind of talent. You know, I have a, there's another independent actor, Greg Prosser, who's a friend of mine. He's also a producer and he's gotten into directing. Yeah. He's been on TV shows. You've seen him. He's got that kind of talent. You know, uh, just because you don't get the right break doesn't mean you don't have the talent. But you look at people like Alex and Kevin and Greg and you could get to that level, but it takes more work than you could ever imagine uh, from acting to your craft, to networking, to everything. And I, I just don't like when other people don't take it serious and say, I'm going to win an Oscar because yeah. it's, it, it takes so much to get to that level. And now having said that, look at these actors this year, you got Bradley Cooper. Yes. What is this? His third best actor nomination. Yeah. For my show. <laughs> You got yes. Coleman Domingo, a very good actor. You got Paul Giamatti and Killian Murphy, who we're going to talk about. And you got Jeffrey Wright, who was great in American fiction. Yeah. But yeah. honestly, in my opinion, this is just my opinion. Take that for what it's worth with a grain of salt. It's a two actor race between Paul Giamatti and Killian mm -hmm. Murphy. I think it's closer than people realize. Most people will give the nod to Killian Murphy. And yes, because he's won all the precursors. Yeah, right? he's won all those awards, including this. 
prestigious SAG award. So he probably will get it. You know, Oppenheimer was, I believe, one of the three highest grossing films of the year. One of the two most successful just in terms of box office and, uh, and you know, reviews, uh, critical acclaim. And it also sold out in a day online and in stores when the DVD and Blu-ray came out and 4K. They sold them all out. You can look it up, as Casey would say. But as, as much as I think he's probably the favorite, I think there is a large faction of people that will vote for Paul Giamatti. Yes, I right. think he is just the type of underdog that could win this award, steal it, however you want to say it. I love Paul Giamatti. It's no, no knock on Killian Murphy. Any other year... I would be rooting for him hard, not only for his success, but he's also another person who's been around. As I say, I've been around the block. So is Killian Murphy and Paul Giamatti. But <laughs> yes. Paul is the everyman. He's not the guy you think of in, in a in a lead role. <clears throat> I I would love to see him win this. The Holdovers was one of my three favorite films of the year. So who would you consider the dark horse in this category with these nominees? So when I look at it, uh I'm going to call Paul Giamatti, not the dark horse, but the mm. underdog, the one okay. who could actually take it and surprise. Killian Murphy's the lead. And I'll probably say Jeffrey Wright is the dark horse. Okay. Uh, and I hope there's no ignorant people that's going to read into what I just said. Yeah. Uh, no, we, we, we you, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, totally we're talking that. about candidates. We're not talking right. about, you know, anything Exa else. Anything and, else. And, uh, but what these do you think days, about you know, Bradley taking it though, like him coming and. I don't in. think Bradley's going to take it. I don't, and it's not a not. Bradley Cooper is one of my six or seven favorite actors out there today, uh, but I just don't. I think Killian Murphy's way ahead. I think Paul Giamatti's way ahead, and I think the dark horse that's not the main underdog, but that could surprise if it's not Giamatti would be Jeffrey Wright, because I've heard a lot of traction for American fiction, uh, but I think it's going to. I think it's going to be Murphy or Giamatti. I'm really rooting hard for so Giamatti. So are they tie in your list or who are you calling? Uh, What's your final call? Right, you know what? I've gotten where I've gotten to by being bold. I'm going to pick Paul Giamatti. I got right. him. Little known okay. fact, his father was uh, A. Bartlett Giamatti, the former commissioner of baseball and the one who expelled Pete Rose. Just, just a little known fact. All right. Well, we're going to move on to the best actress category. I'll list the nominees for you and you can take from there. And we have Emma Stone for Poor Things, Lily Gladstone, Killers of the Flower Moon, Annette Benning for Nyad, Carrie Mulligan, Maestro, and Sandra Huller for Anatomy of a Fall. All right. I'm not going to waste too much time. Because mm. I'm going to say three things. One, mm. Big surprise that Annette Benning got got the nomination for Nyad. Congratulations to her. She's also a pro that's been around the block. But I think this is a two-actress race. I think this is one of the closest races there is. Mm -hmm. Lily Gladstone uh, is, you know, it's hard to call her the favorite. And I'm going to tell you why. Yeah. Because I think there's a lot of traction for Emma Stone with poor things. Absolutely. I think there is some politicalness with the Oscars. I'm not even knocking it. I mean, you know, people want to work with certain people and Emma Stone's probably one of the three biggest actresses out there in Hollywood. So you're going to get a lot of people that would vote for her. Uh, and, and I like Emma Stone. Uh, I'm, I'm rooting for her. Nothing against Lily Gladstone. She's one A on my list, but I just enjoyed poor things. I, I call it an adult art house version of Frankenstein. It's a crazy movie. It's insane. It's not for everyone, right. but but even with the insanity and the nudity and the, it 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 was a fun, interesting movie. I applaud Emma Stone for taking a part like that because a lot of actresses wouldn't. Reminds me of I remember when not that it was an Oscar winning movie, but when there's something about Mary came out, right. Cameron Diaz. It was a big hit, made a lot of money uh, commercially, and they told Cameron Diaz if she took this part, she said this it would be a career ender because of the hair gel scenes. You know, the scene I'm referring yes, to yes, was I not do. hair gel. Ben so Siller, yeah. in the movie, it was not hair gel. So, right. <laughs> but she thought it was funny. She took it and God bless her. And she had great success with it. And the same with Emma Stone. Now, Lily Gladstone, again, any other year where Emma Stone and poor things is not there. I'm, I'm rooting for her. I think she's going to win. 
If you ask me who's going to win, honestly, this is very, it's too close to call. Yeah. Lily Gladstone, uh, I believe she won the SAGs and won pretty much everything. Emma Stone won Best Actress in a Comedy, which they separate in Golden Globes. But I'm going to say, I mean, it's so tight. Lily Gladstone would be the first, right. uh, uh, I believe, American Indian to win. Yes, this an award. indigenous person. Yes. And and so that would that's be that's the narrative around Lily guys. Yeah, Gaston, no, and that and that would be a wonderful accomplishment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very close to call, but because I've been predicting Emma Stone, I'm going to stick with it. Uh, I also love Emma Stone in the role, and I love Lily Gladstone. Don't get me wrong. I just mm -hmm. Four Things was a fun movie. Love Killers of the Flower Moon, a very important movie. I wouldn't call it a fun movie, obviously. Uh, it was a it, it was about a tragic situation, but uh, I I I'm gonna say Emma Stone, but by the skin of her chinny chin chin, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I may be wrong. I may be wrong. It might right. be Gladstone. It's one of those two. Can, if we move, can Carrie Mulligan or Sandra Huller pull off? I do not think Olivia they can. Win. I'm just being straight. I mean, honestly, and, over. Can you? This is not a knock on their performance, though, PT. Yeah, I want to yeah, be yeah. clear. Sure. All of these women were excellent. All of these actors are excellent. But if you're asking me, can they win? I would be shocked. I just, I mean, I think those two are going to garner so many votes that I mentioned, right. Gladstone and Stone. I, you know, I, I think it's going to be hard to to get that to Anyone generate else to get in there. Yeah, I, I just think it will. So now we go to another category, yes. actor in a supporting role. Yes. And again, look at these nominees. Sterling K. Brown, American Fiction. Again, another great movie that had a lot of traction with a twist ending we won't reveal. Robert De Niro, one of the greatest actors of all time, regardless of how anyone feels about him personally. He is one of the greatest actors of all time. And this is Absolutely. an important social movie, Killers of the Flower Moon. Robert Downey Jr., is there a more likable a uh, person to root for, not because others aren't, just because he's been around the block. He battled drugs. He got a nomination at a young age for Chaplin. Uh, yes. And I think, and and he could have arguably won if he was nominated for Iron Man in the in Avengers Endgame. I know the Academy has not been kind to many comic book movies, but true. I thought he was excellent in that. Ryan Gosling and Barbie, Mark Ruffalo in Poor Things. And I thought that was a great part for Mark Ruffalo. He's never played... Yes. Uh, can I say a bad word? Uh, you have one. You can feel your right. with one. He's never played a prick before, but he okay, has in this fine. movie. <laughs> and he was great. I mean, he was funny. He was dislikable, which he's supposed to be, the character. But uh, I think this is Robert Downey Jr.'s category to win. I think everyone's rooting for him. And again, it's not a knock on everyone else. It's It's he... I wouldn't be shocked if someone like Robert De Niro came out of nowhere and won it because you or know, Ruffalo you just kind of sneak in. I'll yeah, because I'll, I'll tell you why. Because he's been around forever and he's great and he's won. What has he won? Three, four Oscars. I lost count. Yes. Uh, and you know the Academy is very familiar with his work, but I I wouldn't be shocked. But I don't think it'll happen. I think it's going to be Robert Downey Jr. I think he's everybody's favorite in this and i think he's gonna win it that's my my opinion. okay robert downey i agree with you i saw his performance in oppenheimer and it's superb superb and excellent an yes. excellent performance all right so we're into the nominees for best supporting actress and the nominees are davine joy randolph for the holdovers emily blunt oppenheimer america ferreira barbie jodie foster nyad and daniel brooks color purple okay so i think it's a one person race uh i, I think, think so too point, uh, divine joy randolph she was my favorite and it's not a knock on anyone else these mm -hmm. are five great actors look at jodie foster she's an all-time actor but if i get a little emotional forgive me divine joy randolph no reminds me of my mom joan baraski i lost my mom you know uh and i remember her you know, we lost her in 2011. So uh, mm -hmm. it was, uh, it was obviously a sad time, but uh, you know, uh, no, we lost her in 2011, 2010. And if you go, well, how do you not know that? Because it's not a, a fun memory for me. I know. I know. It's, it's a, it's 2010. We lost her. It's, it's one of the worst memories in my life. 
And my mom always encouraged me, and she's part of the reason I'm a filmmaker. But you look at Devoid, Divine, I keep saying Devoid, Divine, Divine Joy Randolph and the Holdovers. Again, one of my favorite movies. And this was one of my favorite performances along with Paul Giamatti. That movie doesn't work if either her or Giamatti or the young boy don't work. Correct. You needed all three. And she plays a grieving mom for those that don't know. Her son went to this private school because she worked there. So they let him go there for free and he got a scholarship to college, but he joined the army first during Vietnam. And he's going to, he's going to go to college. He's so proud. You only hear about a story. You don't see him. And she imitates him. Mom, I'm going to go to college. I'm getting a scholarship and I'm going to fight for my country. And he died in Vietnam. And she is distraught through a lot of the film, not all of it, a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, a mother's love for their son and a son's love for their mother are very special, as is a mother's love for her daughter and a daughter's love for her mother. Absolutely. And she conveyed that. And she is funny. She is angry. She is sad. She is redemptive at the end. She like kind of not that she has to redeem herself, but like she she perseveres. And uh, it's her. She's won everything. She's going to win this. I wouldn't even comment on anyone else. Yeah, I agree with you with that. Even her micro expressions are it's just fantastic. So divine Joy Randolph it is. And moving on to the categories. So I would say the next, yeah, the next category that uh, we did all the actors. Um, yes. And now if we just look through some of the, the categories, uh, I have them right up here. Okay. Um, I know you like animated feature, don't you? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, I can listen. You no, know, I, I, the I think it's spider. Or, yeah, I, I, I think it's between Spider Man across the Spider Verse and the Boy and the Heron. Yes. Uh, and I would say it's going to be Spider Man across the Spider Verse. People loved it. Uh, it's Spider Man. You know, he's amazing. I'm calling Hayao my Miyazaki for the Boy and the Heron because you know. I didn't say. He, I think he boycott, boycotted one of the the awards shows for whatever reason, and I think, uh, yeah. So there's a there's a possibility that he could take it. This yeah, is just my yeah no, he's. I have him right there, but I'm gonna say Spider Man across the Spider Verse. That's my pick. Yeah, um, it, yeah, it's a wonderful film. Actually, a, a major category that I want to bring mm -hmm. up is cinematography, okay. uh, and. Uh, I think you look at all the wonderful cinematography. This could be poor things because okay. from what you saw along with CGI together, it, it reminds me of what frame, uh, who framed Roger Rabbit in which a dear friend, Dean Kundi was nominated. He's attached to shoot my film, stay fresh. Mm -hmm. He's an Oscar nominated okay. VP and he worked on Jurassic park and all three oh, wow. the future movies and Apollo 13 and, uh, the original Halloween, the I said Jurassic Park, so many, you know. Uh, yes. And it reminds me, he was nominated for Who Framed Roger Rabbit. You look at poor things with the actual cinematography, and there was some CGI and other stuff, and to build that world. And I just think it was, I, I would go with Robbie Ryan of Poor Things. Um, but, you know, you look at Killers of the Flower Moon, Rodrigo Prieto, and Matthew Libatica of, Ma of Maestro, they're both great. They're like yeah. all-time DPs, and and Oppenheimer, of course, could win Hoyt von Hoytema, uh, but I I'm going with Robbie Ryan of Poor Things. That's me for best cinematography. I think for me it's almost like a tie. I'm not sure. I'm thinking Oppenheimer. They may yeah, Oppenheimer yeah. can pull it out. It's probably yeah. going to be the big winner of the night. Although I do think Poor Things is that like that. I won't even say dark horse. I'll say that underdog that could upset it in some category. Right. It, right. it remains to be seen. If we go from there to costume design, yes. uh, this this is like anyone's game because you look at a movie like Barbie, the costumes were one of the- Yes, and, yes. One of the draws for that, for sure. You know, sure. And you look at Killers of the Flower Moon, a period piece, Napoleon, a period piece, uh, Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer, a period, period piece. piece, and then Poor Things. Poor Things. Um, but Poor Things was so unique. I'm going to go with Poor Things. It may not win, but I- I like the costumes. I like, remember, this is this like sci-fi steampunk adult version of Frankenstein set in the 20s. And uh, mm. I, I'm going with poor things. Holly, Holly Waddington did the costumes, but this is a pretty wide open category. What do you think? I'm thinking Napoleon 
I know uh, it's a period piece and it hasn't gotten a lot of raves in terms of critical acclaim, but... No, but I, for a category like this, you're right. Yes. It could win. And I like Napoleon. Uh, you know, it's just, it's tough. It's tough to know what Oscar will like and not, but uh, I could see Napoleon winning. The yes. costumes were excellent. It was a period piece, like you said. A lot of attention um, to details. All that good stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so... Um, Moving right along. We're moving right along. I, why don't we look at, uh, uh, I want to go to editing if we can. We'll jump oh, around. Sure. And yeah, I want to say sure, that we're sure, going to cover sure. almost every category, but we're going to skip a few. Uh, we're just in the interest of time and keeping it. And I'm not knocking any category. I'm just, uh, we're just, you know, doing. Uh, all right. So I'll so just. If we go the... to editing, I, I again, this is a pretty wide open category. You got Anatomy of a Fall. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lorene Senecal was the editor. Kevin Trent edited the holdovers. Mm -hmm. Thelma Schoonmacher did Killers of the Flower Moon. She's uh, she won three, four. She's Scorsese's editor. She's excellent. Yes. She is a legend. Oppenheimer, Jennifer Lame, and uh, Yorgos Mavra. Parsaridis, <laughs> wow. not the director. Yorgos Lanthimos. Yeah, yeah, I know. That Yorgos Mavro. <laughs> I'm going to say it one more time. Yorgos Mavro Pasaridis. I think I said it. Third time was a charm. Um, but I'm going to go with Thelma Schoonmacher. Jennifer Lame could win for Oppenheimer. I wouldn't be shocked. But Thelma's a legend. She's done all the big Scorsese films. Uh, mm -hmm. Thelma's kind of a hero of mine. Uh, I know all about her editing. Uh, very familiar with her. Any film fan is. Uh, you look at all the movies Scorsese did over the, over the years, like The Departed, like Goodfellas, yeah. you know, uh, Taxi Driver, Casino, and you know, Thelma's a legend, and 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 I think, I think this is one that could go to Killers of the Flower Moon. I'm gonna go with Oppenheimer because it was just amazing what they did with just cutting from scene to scene even that would be the one scene. if it's not Thelma it's going to be Oppenheimer yeah well, so. I'm going to stick with Thelma and Killers of the Flower Moon look at at international feature film I haven't seen okay. them all yet I know that's terrible to say and I've seen most of the films <laughs> but the one no that it I believe you were just going to see it the other day uh I'm going to go with the zone of interest yes yes uh the zone of interest or even the Society of the Snow. Yes, I've heard about Society of the Snow, uh, and I do want to see that. But I will say Zone of Interest is also nominated for Best Picture, I believe. Yes, it is. It is, and it, it did very well at BAFTAs as well. So, so. I, I, I kind of feel like, yeah, you know, I feel like, uh, I don't want to say the year that um, Parasite won, because Parasite mm -hmm. swept everything, but it was understood that was winning Best International Feature. That's how I feel about Zone of Interest. Now, whether I'm right, we'll see. Um, yeah. Again, and that's so the, why we talk about these things. Look at makeup and hairstyling, another very important category. They helped yes. build the world by building the characters. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to go with, I know this is a little trend. And I'm really but, upset that Priscilla isn't here, to be honest. <laughs> yes. I thought she should it should be here for sure. With Again, what on. Oscar likes and what Oscar doesn't is yeah. you can't say, but for me, uh, it's going to sound like a broken record. I'm going poor things because they had to make Emma Stone, who's very attractive. Not that she's unattractive in the movie, but she's as unattractive as you'll ever see her. She's like a female Frankenstein in a way. Although throughout the movie, as her brain evolves, mm -hmm. uh, she does seem to get more and more attractive and you hear her speech evolve, but her look, uh, her hair, the same thing with the other people in the movie, Willem Dafoe, who my contention is he's supposed to be the Frankenstein monster because he talks about how his father experimented on him and he's got all these stitches in his face. Why would he have them? I know he's not called that. He's not called Frankenstein, but he could have changed his name. That's like my take on the, thing yeah. he grew up and his brain evolved like hers if frankenstein's brain could evolve what would happen and he looks that way and you look at the make the makeup in that movie and the hair and it's wild and uh, i'm just gonna go with that who's your pick 
Well, I was looking at Society of the Snow. But it's very, they're very subtle changes, but they look so real. Uh, I don't want to give too much away about it, but as they become more emaciated, it, it just looks very, very real. And what about Bradley Cooper's makeup, and especially towards the end of the film? No, the he, last yeah, one. the makeup in Maestro was great, but I don't know if I put it on the same level as Poor Things. I mean, okay, because Poor Things again. It, it, it just, it, it's not only sort of a period piece, it's sci-fi, it's steampunk. If the makeup doesn't work in there, then that movie really doesn't work. Okay. Well, my pick is uh, The Society of the Snow. <laughs> so that's the original score. Let's go on to that. All right. This is a tough category for me. Uh, but even though I love poor things and watch it probably win now, I'm going to go with John Williams, the great John Williams. Uh, mm. Does he have more Oscars than any other composer? If he doesn't, I don't know I, who's beating. I think he, he does. And he's probably got the most nominations. I mean, you look at all the things. It's probably him and the then years. Hans Zimmer. Yeah. But John Williams, he's, you know, you're talking about Indiana Jones. You're talking mm -hmm. about Star Wars. You're talking about, I believe he was Jaws. You're talking like all e. these. E.T. and on and on. E.T., all these uh, huge movies and franchises. And so I'm going to go with him for Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. And I don't think we could do this without me going. Dun, 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 dun. I just had to throw in the original score. I'm going to go with Ludwig. Gorenson for Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer. Yeah, I could tell you like Oppenheimer. <laughs> uh, well, not that I like it like that, but I mean, Ludwig is just great. And I'm, you know, he's won before, but it's just an awesome score. What can I say? I'm, I'm going to let you uh, pick <laughs> the original song first because it's a very hard category to pick. <laughs> Best original song. Okay, I'll go through the nominees The Fire Inside uh, from Flaming Hot. Music and lyrics by Diane Warren. <laughs> She's always here. Um, I'm Just Ken from Barbie. Music and lyrics by Mark Ronson and Andrew Wyatt. It Never Went Away from American Symphony. Music and lyrics by John Baptiste, and he's wonderful. And Don Wilson. And uh, let's see, this other one is for Killers of the Flower Moon. Now I can't pronounce this one for my Hazzing. Well, has he a song for my people, right? Yes. And uh, what's the other one here? What, what was, was I, I made, made for? for? From Barbie. From Barbie. Billy Eilish. The great Billy Eilish. Uh, yes, and Phineas O'Connell. So that's great. Well, and I, it's a beautiful song. That The song is beautiful, Billy Eilish. The it song is. is. Yes, it is a beautiful song. I'm thinking that if there is like a little underdog that comes up it could be john baptiste because he's on a roll with the grammys and all this good stuff so we'll see what happens with that but my pick would definitely be for billy eilish all right so i'm gonna go in the other direction with barbie okay. because i thought it was a ridiculous song and i'm gonna make a ridiculous <laughs> pick i'm just ken i'm gonna go with that how could i not he's performing so you know you never know <laughs> wait 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 is you're saying um yes uh, ryan gosling is, is ryan gosling i'm definitely going with i'm just ken yes he's performing i <laughs> that is so that might be the most bizarre since robin williams doing blame canada you remember that uh and it won <laughs> from from <laughs> south park i believe it won blame canada you don't remember that blame canada blame <laughs> canada and he was like hopping around on stage I think my mother almost had a heart attack. She was watching the Oscars that she's like, that song was nominated. And I believe it won. My friend Stephen Hart would correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. We watched it together. Uh, but I believe Blame Canada won. Uh, so that was that's an interesting category. We'll see who. Yes, who but wins. Ryan Gosling is performing. And yeah, so we'll see what happens with that. Next category. Next category. So let's do best animated short. Uh, I haven't seen all of them, but uh, uh, one of the ones that I've been hearing a lot about, uh, I heard two and I'm familiar with is Letter to a Pig and Pachyderm. So I'm just going to say Letter to a Pig. I haven't seen them all. So this is an uneducated right. guess. Well, I think I'll go with uh, with that as well. 
<laughs> we'll see. What it's happens. a fun I'm one, happy. right? Letter to yeah. a pig. Yes, absolutely. Which is probably some serious dark short film. But let's move on to one of my favorite categories, live action short. To me, it's yes. uh, and and you know it may not win, but I think I'm giving it the nod. I I saw it; it was very powerful. And now, listen, this short is not for everyone. Some will love it, and some will hate it, depending on what side of the debate you're on. Uh, and I'm not going to go into what it is because I get, I think it's better you go in blind. And these live action shorts, as well as the animated shorts, travel the country, and you'll see them in theaters either near you or an hour away depending on where you live, what kind of an area, if there are art houses. Uh, but even some multiplexes will run them. And if you get a chance, I always prefer the live action shorts. Go see these short films that were made by everything from established filmmakers, because Spike Lee and other Oscar nominees make shorts now, to student filmmakers, to professional filmmakers that aren't as well-known indie filmmakers. Go see the live action shorts; they're really great. But uh, yeah, yeah, speak a little bit about about your short that made it all the way in. Oh, oh, uh, it qualified the Mandala Maker. Uh, that yes. kind of set my career on a path, and that was one of my most favorite things in the industry. Had I made it today, it probably would be even better. Had I learned the Oscar process like I know it today, I think it would have gone farther but uh when you qualify and then you make a cut down and then they get to 10 and then they go okay here are the nominations and they crush you only half get them but but i say that <laughs> kidding that was one of the greatest processes i ever went through i was very proud no it disappointment um and you know you, there's only a handful of films in the whole world that qualify and uh we won some festivals i went to the film columbia festival which is only for films that qualify and most that get nominated for the Oscar. It was a wonderful, I mean, Up in the Air was there that year. The Men Who Stare at Goats, the Coen Brothers movie, or um, An Ordinary Man. Um, oh, yeah, that's the a last tough movie category. for Heath yeah. Ledger, The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. And I, I believe they fi finished that movie with different actors. So, like, the doctor changes his appearance. That's how they were able to do it. But, um, I think I believe Johnny Depp was one of the people who filled in for Heath Ledger. But <coughs> playing film Columbia was like going to Sundance. It's in upstate New York. It's in the Hudson. <coughs> Excuse me. It's in the Hudson Valley. And uh, it was just a great thrill to play there. They treated me like, you know, they were people would come around if they saw you with your filmmaker badge at one of the restaurants. Mm -hmm. And the town is very much like, you know. Sundance, the way they they do the festival, okay. very much like Park City, Utah, and uh, you know they 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 saw it, they're like you're Sam Borowski, you did the Mandala Maker because it says your name on your badge, and mm -hmm. I was like you're familiar. They're like oh I got the program, sign it, autograph it. God bless them. I don't know why they would want my signature, but it's a major accomplishment. Did. Well, it it was it you know it was a head rush. It was nice. And the fact that they were familiar with my film and they read up on it and they reviewed it in the paper and it just, they just do it right, Film Columbia. And that, that was fun for me to do it. Now, another film that deals with a very serious subject matter like mine did uh, is Red, White, and Blue. Nazrin Chowdhury and Sarah McFarlane uh, directed it uh, and produced it along with Brittany Snow, who not only started it from Pitch Perfect fame, but produced it. And she'll be at the awards. She's been picking out her dress this week. I, I had an opportunity to meet Brittany. What a beautiful human being. Very nice. Giving of her time. Uh, she has this book called September Letters with uh, Jasper Guest. And Jasper is like a, a, she did public relations. She's a jack of all trades. I want Jasper to produce one of my next movies. I told her that because uh, awesome. she's just a go-getter. But there are people who are going to love Red, White, and Blue film. And there are people who are going to absolutely hate it. Uh, but that's okay. That means a film did its job. Because if yes. you don't feel any kind of a way about a film, you know, then it didn't do it. If it's like, meh, it didn't do its job. If you love it or if you hate it, it did its job. And it's a very powerful film about similar subject matter to The Mandala Maker. That's all I want to say. Oh. Seek the film out. You can't see it on... Um, for a while, it was on YouTube for free just for a limited period. But it's going to travel the country with the live action shorts. 
which will still be playing in theaters after the Oscars. Seek it out, see it. Uh, that's the film that's going to win, I believe. And uh, if it does, you'll see Britney on stage with uh, Nazareth and Sarah. So what do you think of the wonderful story of Henry Sugar with Wes, Wes Anderson? No, Wes Anderson's a great filmmaker, and that's a great short, but I'm I'm sticking with Red, White, and Blue. It's not that I don't like the wonderful story of Henry Sugar. I I I was touched and moved by Red, White, and Blue. I'm not saying I loved it. I'm not saying I hated it because I don't want to get in that debate. I'm saying I was touched and moved, and I don't see how a human being can't be by this film. Okay. I haven't seen it yet, but it would be nice for a lesser-known filmmaker to get some accolades yes and seek seek it out you'll you'll be moved by it you may even hate it you may love it but seek it out all right so here's a special category for me because right. i think a lot of people don't think of it when they think of oscars they think it's a lesser award which it is not visual effects for a lot of these mm -hmm. action movies superhero movies even you know uh even movies like napoleon or mission impossible the you know Visual effects, you can't make them without that. And I think a lot of people are rooting for Godzilla minus one. I am yeah, not. It's very I, popular. I, I'm not rooting <laughs> for that. I'm not rooting for Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part One, or Napoleon. I'm rooting for my favorite Marvel franchise, Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three is up for this award. I want to be able to say it's an Oscar winning movie. So if it wins, much like Suicide Squad, the much maligned DC movie that I probably was the only person in America who liked it. I'm not knocking it. I loved it. I thought it was a fun movie and people, for whatever reason, hated it. I don't want to debate that. But it won in visual effects. I remember looking at my friend Stephen Hart. He threw an Oscar party that year. And I looked at him and I said, Suicide Squad is now an Oscar winning movie. And uh, some little, little Oscar lore uh, memories from me. But uh, he, and then he started reading the list Someone posted on social media, list of movies that haven't won Oscar, Star Wars, this, that. Like <laughs> He's like, Suicide Squad has won an Oscar. But but uh, Guardians of the Galaxy is a very important Marvel franchise. And Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is easily the most successful Marvel movie in the last three years. Some might argue the only one that's on that level since, uh, since Avengers Endgame. And I think... The whole movie, Chris Pratt's performance, it proves to you you can have drama, real drama, uh, Oscar-winning drama without dipping into melodrama in a, in a superhero movie. That moment when he puts on in the first movie, Guardians of the Galaxy, and he plays uh, Ain't No Mountain High Enough on the tape, the cassette in his spaceship, because his mother liked music from the 60s and 70s, and so did my mother. It really reminded me of my mother, Joan Borowski, and he put it on. And this tear, a single tear drips down and he's got this look. And it's the first time he's listened to the gift she gave him on her deathbed. It's a tape with music. And that's and there's moments like that in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, including when he decides he's going to go back to Earth at the end. You know, Gamora still that she she starts to have feelings for him, but not enough to stay with him. She doesn't fully remember him. She says, I bet we were fun. And he says, like, you wouldn't believe. And anyone who's ever lost a girl knows how painful that was. You know, I wanted them, And I said, I'm going to hate this movie if they don't get together. Well, they didn't get together. And I didn't hate it. <laughs> because the way yeah. James Gunn did it, manipulated you, was a great thing. So then he decides, I'm going home. I'm going to see my grandpa. Even though he, you know, he may have been exaggerating when he said he'd be like 90. Maybe he was 75 or 80. Yeah. It may have been a joke. Maybe he was 90. But he goes... And his grandpa's still alive. And they're playing the song, uh, The Dog Days Are Over by Florence and the Machine, which was perfect for that movie. Love that song. And when he's walking, you know, that part in the song, and it's like, and uh, and he's walking down the street. <laughs> it's Illinois. And uh, he knocks on the door. And I don't know if that's like his care, his nurse or care maid or girlfriend. They don't really tell you. And He's like, I'm sorry, do I have the right house? I'm looking for Jason Quill. She's like, you have the right house. And the look on her face is she knows that he's like her grandson. And the second he goes in, you know, he's grown up. And uh, the actor looks up. I believe it's Greg Henry. And he and he goes, Pete? And they hug and it's, it's beautiful. He's like, hey, grandpa. And uh, I met that actor who was in James Gunn's movie Slither. I had the 
Oh, neat. I had the, yeah, I had the, uh, thanks to my friend Scott Essman, who then was at Universal Studios, I had the pleasure of attending the Slither premiere. I met James and Greg Henry plays the mayor. Um, and, uh, you know, he also plays the grandpa and Greg. He's not as old as he looks, obviously, in the third <laughs> movie, it's makeup. And uh, mm -hmm. he's nowhere near that old. And uh, just a real nice guy. I remember having a nice conversation with him. I gave him my card. But I want to see Guardian in a very roundabout way. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 win. I will not even speak about another movie. Who do you want to win? I think it could be the creator. They've been building momentum. And it was a great film. I the, the visuals were absolutely spectacular, but I think the Academy may go with God, Godzilla minus one. Yeah, that seems to be the one a lot of people are talking mm -hmm. about, but I really am rooting hard for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume mm -hmm. 3, but if it doesn't get it, it doesn't get it. I'll yeah. just cry a little bit. Uh, <laughs> like I did for Austin Butler last year uh, in Best Actor, I felt for him. I thought he was the best portrayal of Elvis ever. All yes, right, now on to be ready for this. And I know they are some of your favorite categories, PT, because okay. you're a writer. Yes. Writing. So let's start well with the adapted screenplay. Oh, beautiful. Um, so I think I, I it's a three-person race. Okay. I think it's Tony McNamara's Poor Things. I think it's Oppenheimer. Christopher Nolan wrote that, and this could be his. And I mm -hmm. think it's American Fiction. Uh, Core Jeff wrote it on so, yeah. the screen. Um, so I think, uh, I believe Tony McNamara, he adapted his own story. Um, mm. uh, Christopher Nolan, uh, is Oppenheimer based on a book? Mm, yes, it is. They usually put the book author's name. I don't see it here. Um, mm. But... Uh, also, also, uh, movies like Barbie, because Barbie had her own story as a toy. American Prometheus, Prometheus, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer by okay. Kai Bird. All right. Usually they would put him by Christopher Nolan. But mm -hmm. a movie like Barbie, it's not based on a short story so much as it was a previous character. It's a doll. It had a cartoon. So that's why it's in Best Adapted, just to explain for everyone. American fiction was written for the screen by Cord Jefferson. Uh, I, I think it's between Cord Jefferson, Tony McNamara, and Poor Things, and Christopher Nolan for Oppenheimer. Uh, I'm going to probably say, I wouldn't be shocked if American fiction took this, but I'm going to go with Oppenheimer and Christopher Nolan. I'm, 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 I'm going to go with Jonathan Glazer for the, the zone of interest. Really? That's, now that's a dark horse. <laughs> yep, I know. Uh, but so. but uh, God bless you. You had the <laughs> the whole is to pick that. So yes. all right, let's go to writing original screenplay. And okay. these are movies written directly for the screen, not based on a previous material, book, story, or character. Mm -hmm. So uh, you look at them. Uh, I'm gonna, without going over every nominee. I could see Maestro getting something here. It was written by Bradley Cooper and Josh Singer, but I'm going with the holdovers uh, written by one person, David Hemmingson. Uh, this to me reads like a best act, a uh, best Oscar screenplay, because when you watch the movie, it, it's so filled with heart, great character arcs, especially Paul Giamatti without going into it and divine joy Randolph. Mm -hmm. All three of the main characters have great character arcs. But but Paul and Divine, their character arcs kind of define this movie. And, uh, you know, without going into what they do, you should see it for yourself without ruining it. The Holdovers is a movie you want to see. I'm going with David Hemmingson. Who are you going with? Justin Trier, an author Harari for Anatomy of a Fall. Wow, that have... was not who I thought you were going to say. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that there's something going on there and it wouldn't surprise me at all if they won. See, now that would surprise me when I look at the other, because if they're going to give Bradley Cooper something, it might be this. Uh, this this is one maestro could win. And I think the holdovers is one of the favorites. Not saying an anatomy of a fall couldn't win, but it would surprise me. It really would. So I guess now I'm going to be looking at that category even more. Yes, uh, it's been building momentum. They've won some precursors. So anything's possible. So before we get to the biggies, I just want to go over sound real quick. Okay. Um, and I'm going to say, 
see any of these can win because you look at a movie like Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning Part One. The mm -hmm. sound—I mean, sounds is important for every movie. You know, it's the old joke: if you have terrible sound, they'll go, "Oh boy, that movie looks dark. What's wrong with the color?" You, you can't have bad sound on your movie. That's like a prerequisite. It's a non-negotiable. But Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 with all the special effects and sound effects, you need that kind of sound. Maestro, a movie that, you know, had music and and the sound is even more important. Oppenheimer, uh, mm -hmm. the sound. Uh, so I think any one of those three could win. Yes. Uh, but uh, And then you got the zone of interest. Mm -hmm. But if I had to pick... I'd say it's between Oppenheimer and Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. I'm going to go with Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 because it could win an award like this. All right. I'm going with the zone of interest. The whole premise. You know, I almost said the zone of interest, <laughs> but sound is a particular award, yes. and it's just very hard, uh, you know. Well, it's it the premise of the film, right? That the, the whole allure of the film is because of the sounds and how they are edited and whatnot. Sure. One yes. more, because production right. design is how you build the world visually. Yes. And uh, again, this is really, whoever wins this year is should be impressed with themselves. You got poor things. And when you look at the steampunk sci-fi period piece costumes and background mm -hmm. and everything involved with the world, um, it's not about the costumes, but you know, when you look at what the world looked like with the costumes and everything, like their productions, same thing with Oppenheimer, a mm -hmm. period piece, very hard to film a period piece because you can't just go film anywhere. Napoleon, same thing, Killers yes. of the Flower Moon, Barbie, which a lot of people didn't think was an Oscar nominated. I'm not knocking it, I'm telling you comments I've gotten, but they cannot knock the production design because. Not saying they can knock anything, but I'm saying the set decoration and the production design on a movie like this is very important. Uh, this is again a very hard category to pick. Yes, I agree. And I'm I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with poor things, not because it's a favorite of mine, because I, I see that any of them could win. I can't just pick two like that and Killers of the Flower Moon, Napoleon, Oppenheimer, Barbie. But poor things, when you look at the set decoration and you look at the production design, mm -hmm. it, you couldn't do that movie without that specific steampunk sci-fi period look. And that's right. not easy to do. Yes, I agree. I think, yeah, for me, I, I would agree with you with poor things, but it's a possibility that Napoleon could sneak in there as well. Yeah. I mean, Napoleon, the, the battle scenes and whatnot. Period. I mean, it's just a lot. Of so, stuff uh, I can't disagree with you there. Um, now, the two, what some would argue, are the two biggest awards of the evening. Let's go to directing, best director award. As a director, I'm obviously interested in this. And again, you've got every year you could say they're, they're the best of the best. But I look at Killers of the Flower Moon. You got Martin Scorsese, who's one of my heroes. Oppenheimer, Christopher Nolan, probably the favorite. Poor Things. Yorgos Lanthimos, a great director. Um, Zone of Interest, Jonathan Glazer, uh, which you like. Uh, Anatomy <laughs> of the Fall. Well, I know you like it from the way you're talking. Justin Triet. So yes. I look at these, uh, I, I immediately, and this is not a knock on anyone. If the Zone of Interest does not become uh, Parasite and win this in Best Picture, like I don't expect it to, but, you know, it's Oscar. You never know. Then my three candidates would be, I always consider Martin Scorsese a major candidate, Killers of the Flower Moon, Oppenheimer, Christopher Nolan, Yorgos Lanthimos, most poor things. But I think this is Christopher Nolan's. I think it's like I, a coronation. It was the, it's going to be the big winner. And I think because he, he's been such a great director, producer, writer for so many years, dating back to one of my favorite movies of all time is Memento. Uh, yes, um, which he co-wrote with his brother Jonathan Nolan, uh, or he wrote it based on Jonathan Nolan's short story, and yes. he directed it. And honestly, I think this is Christopher Nolan's coronation. It's kind of like when Martin Scorsese won for The Departed. Yeah, I agree with you with Christopher Nolan. He has all, all of the momentum coming into this. He's won most of the the awards. 
Uh, I mean, it's like he, he has definitely has the momentum and I can't see anybody else winning this. I mean, we could have a surprise from for poor things, but I, I seriously doubt that. No, I, I, I agree uh, wholeheartedly, my accord. Now we come down to the big kahuna boom, for boom, all boom. the marbles, best picture. Uh, and rather than go through all the categories, uh, for, uh, all the nominees, rather, for me, you know that I, I really like. Um, poor things. Uh, I'm, you know, the zone of interest is, is, is a dark horse. Um, yes, it is. Killers of the Flower Moon is a very important movie. The Holdovers was one of my favorite pictures. But having said all that, I think it's Oppenheimer. I think, again, it's a coronation for Christopher Nolan, uh, who also, um, I just ran past it. There we go. Uh, <laughs> who also produced the film, uh, with Charles Roven and Emma Thomas. I think it's a, it's a coronation. I think that's the best picture this year. I think it's almost a lock. I won't say a lock, but I'll say it's just beneath a lock, only because I leave a little room for something crazy to happen. But I think it's a, it's close to a lock. What do you think? I am thinking poor things because poor things are still in the theaters. The, the ballots are just put in. There's there was a momentum building before that. Wow, you're <laughs> picking my movie, Poor Things, yes, over Oppenheimer? Yes. Over Oppenheimer, definitely. I'm, I, I would love to see Poor Things. I can't see it beating Oppenheimer. That's me. I right, hope yeah. I'm wrong. I hope you're right. Yes, I can definitely see that happening and, and kind of pulling a moonlight uh, because – it has is building this momentum it has is it's been building and it's it's still at the theaters people are still watching it people are talking about it and i think like you said christopher nolan and his coronation they, this is his this is his gift the, the best director but for best picture it could definitely go to something like poor things or even the zone of interest let's you know let's hope if it does pull a moonlight they don't announce it as oppenheimer <laughs> would be interesting because Emma Stone was in La La Land which they <laughs> incorrectly announced and I always got a kick out of her. She's like, they are not going to blame me for this because uh, the guy was taking pictures with her from, from Price Waterhouse Cooper, Price Cooper right. Waterhouse, you know, the yeah, company yeah, yeah. that yes, yes. Oscars that tallies them. And I think he accidentally gave the backup envelope for Best Actress, which is why Warren Beatty was confused. He saw Best mm -hmm. Actress Emma Stone, La La Land. So he just, I don't understand it. He read La La Land. And uh, I love Warren Beatty. I thought he's like, oh, well, and we're like, something's not right here. And uh, I, I, rem I remember that well. And it would be ironic if they announced it as Oppenheimer and it was poor things and Emma Stone was on the <laughs> other end of the spectrum <laughs> yes. where they didn't announce her movie and it won as opposed to what happened. But we're not blaming Emma Stone. We love Emma Stone. Uh, if I could finish with two things before I, give my information and tell a little bit about what I'm about. Two of my favorite Oscar memories, mm -hmm. uh, a friend of mine, uh, Sean Christensen, he's an acquaintance I met at the Tribeca Film Festival. His short won that year uh, for Curfew. I thought it was the best short to this day that I've ever seen. And I vehemently disagree with other people. It's the best short I've ever seen. Uh, he, it's called Curfew. You could probably find it online somewhere. It's worth it. Um, he... You'll laugh, you'll cry. Uh, it's it's basically about a, uh, this guy Richie, who's considering killing himself. He's in a bathtub and he's he's self uh, mutilating with a with a uh, a razor blade. I know it's tough to take. He's he's essentially there's no nudity. He's sitting in his underwear in the tub and he's just slicing up his body. And then and you go this it is harsh, but it's done in a dark comedic way. And then he looks at his wrist like I'm going to do it. The phone rings. He picks it up. He's like, yes. And she's like, Richie, I got no one else. Will you watch her? Yes. And then he's cleaning himself up his arms. He's taping them up, the wounds. And he's going to watch his niece, who he hasn't seen in several years. And she's more than he can handle. Uh, and it, it's revealed why he hasn't seen her and why his sister needed him to watch her. She had mm -hmm. something she had to take care of that was serious. And... Uh, it's socially relevant and, but it's funny, like the way he interacts with the niece and they kind of, when I say fall in love, I mean in a niece uncle sort of way, obviously I'm not right. anything disgusting. Got to watch what right. you say these days. But, I know you do. 
But no, he grows a real love for her like an uncle. And, you know, they're on the subway going back home to the apartment. And the mother makes good money and they got this really nice high rise. And, you know, she has her head on his shoulder. And when he gets there, she's like, "You're this is a one-time deal, Richie. You're never going to see her again. I don't want you around her. And she basically tells him, look, you want her over. So you're the fun guy. I'm the, but you're never around. You're not someone who could be depended on. And then he tells this story about how his sister's his hero, how she's the coolest person in his life. And she stood up for him when he was like 12 and got beat up and his sister knocked the boy out. And it's the coolest moment because she she's looking at him like, oh, yeah, you think you won her over and you're so cool and you're this drug addict and you're never around for anyone. And then he talks about how she's the coolest sister ever. It, it, it's really sweet. And uh, I'm going to ruin it, but it shouldn't stop you from seeing it. He jumps right <laughs> back in the bathtub, takes the, the the white tape off, picks up the razor blade, and he's looking at his wrist, and he's looking at his wrist, and he's looking at his wrist, and then the phone. And it's funny. The phone looks like the bat phone. It's an old red dial phone, like the bat phone. And he looks at it. He unplugs it when it's ringing. He waits a minute. He plugs it back in. It's still ringing. He picks it up, and she's like, Richie, I need help would you watch her like Fridays and Sundays? And he says, yes. And it ends and they have this great song and it, 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 it ends on an up note. Like he's going to get his life together and she's going to try. Like it's yeah, really like beautiful. That. It's the best short I have ever seen to this day. And I will fist fight someone that says, it's not. <laughs> anyway, I met Sean at Tribeca, had a nice conversation nice. with him. And he was asking me how I got the cast for nightclub, my feature, uh, which was just, uh, on the festival circuit at that time, I had Oscar winner Ernie, Ernie Borgnon. I had Natasha Leone, Paul Sorvino, Zachary Abel from ABC Families Make It or Break It, Daniel Roebuck. Great cast. Uh, Chuck McCann, uh, I think I said Natasha Leone, Ani Her from Gran Torino. And he was impressed. And I said, Sean, you're going to win an Oscar for the short. He's like, oh, man, don't. Like, I think he's afraid I jinxed it. He wasn't even thinking that. He's very humble. And I said, Sean, you're going to win. And then he got nominated. He wrote on social media. Today, I got nominated for an Oscar. And uh, I remember watching the ceremony, and I said his name a second before they read the winner. I was sure of it. And then they said, Sean Christensen. And he went up and he accepted in a very teary-eyed, emotional speech. And I'm not going to speak for Sean, but I got the idea that the movie was semi-autobiographical. Someone asked him that backstage at the Oscars, and he didn't skirt the question. But that's for Sean to, to confirm or deny uh, but I, I, that was one of my favorite memories. And my favorite Oscar memory, and it can't be anything but this, uh, was the year uh, that Denzel Washington won for glory. And you say, well, why, Sam? I like Denzel, but that's not why. I wasn't even rooting for him. My cousin, Danny Aiello, was the runner-up that year for Do the Right Thing. Spike, right. please do the right thing. Danny uh, was a great inspiration to me. And I always, like I say, John Travolta is the reason I'm a filmmaker, and that's true. But the two people right after that are my mom and Danny Aiello. My mom, Joan Borowski, who always encouraged me, and Danny Aiello, my cousin, who I looked up to, and I used to call on the phone and get advice. I met Danny many times. Uh, uh, somewhere, Dwayne Whitaker, who you know is Maynard in Pulp Fiction, is being a wise ass, and he's sitting at home going, Danny Aiello is your cousin? Because he loves to say that to me because he obviously knows that he is. So <laughs> that's his way of saying, yeah, I've heard this before. But I don't care, Dwayne. Yes, Danny <laughs> Aiello is my cousin. Uh, and I think we should get Dwayne to do a podcast. But okay. uh, good luck yeah, with that one. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I think Danny Roebuck would do it. Dwayne, I don't know. Dwayne is a, is a tougher sell. I don't like doing any interviews. But anyway... He, he, he's going to say, Jenny, are you your cousin? Yes, Danny, I is my cousin. And, uh, you know, I'm very proud of it. And the year that he was nominated, the Daily News wrote he was going to be the favorite. Remember, Denzel was not Denzel back then, as yes, he is now. Yeah, that's true. And we were so proud of him, just seeing him sitting there smiling. And uh, Danny, I is the one who told me you should make a short film. When I had produced, at that point, when he said that, I had produced one feature. Maybe I was doing my second feature. And he said, I'm not saying don't keep doing features. But uh, I was, uh, the two features I produced, I didn't direct. And he was telling me, I want to see you direct a short, write and direct a short. I'll do it. You know, cause he had done one for Christine Lati and it won 
best short. Right. Him and there was there was another major name actor in Christine Short. And I remember Christine running up. She was in the bathroom, I think. She was she was having stomach issues, or I think she was just nervous. It was a famous story. And I think like the award before, and they said, Christine, you're up, you're next. And she came in, and I remember when she won, she was running down the aisle crying and smiling. And Danny was the one who told her, make a short film. And he told me, and I then made the mandala maker. So God bless you, Danny. God bless and stay fresh. But those are my two favorite Oscar memories. Uh, and if I might, PT, I'll just tell a little bit about myself. You know, I'm a writer, director, and a producer. Yes. I do this full time. I make features. I still make shorts. I love discovering new talent. When I met Kevin Brody uh, three years ago, uh, I saw something in him, and it's the same feeling I got when I met Alexandra Dolgett. I actually hadn't met her yet. I'd met her work online, and I called her. Very talented young woman. Greg Prosser, I met at a film festival, and he took my class. And from that, he went on to become – he not only runs a full-time business, he is a working actor, second full-time job. He produces. He directs. I respect Greg. Uh, I, 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 I don't want to say I've discovered all these people, but I feel like Alexandra and – Kevin, I did. And, uh, and I, Greg came on my radar, but uh, I love discovering new talent. I teach an acting class at least once a month, sometimes twice. Uh, you can reach me by finding me on uh, Facebook or where I'm Sam Borowski. But if you see an older man, that's my father. I take no responsibility for what he'll <laughs> say. If you contact him uh, on, on Instagram, I'm Borowski Sam. Uh, you can't miss me. Uh, my work email is cinematic heroes. It's still at AOL. I'm the last person. C I N E M A T I C H E R O E S. Everyone forgets that last E in heroes at AOL.com. Reach out to me. If you're, I'm doing a class this Saturday, we're doing a competition, the Sammies. So if you hear this before Saturday, the, uh, ninth, even if it's Friday, the eighth, reach out to me. Uh, if you're interested in next month's class, uh, but don't reach out to me and say, I want to work with you. I want to be in your movies. I've had two actors do that. And then when you tell them I teach a class, they go, well, I don't want to take a class. I don't want to pay for a class. I don't want to show you my work, but can I work with you? I can't stand that. It, it, I'm not going to just, oh, you're a nice guy. You messaged me. That's foolish. I have to see your work. And if you want me to see your work, show it to me. But you look at someone like Alexandra, I, I reached out to Alex because I saw her work and I said, this girl's brilliant. Mm -hmm. I mean, this girl... Uh, she, she is such a talented actress. Uh, she might become the best actress I've ever worked with. I haven't officially worked with her yet. That's how good she is. Uh, and Kevin is very talented and Greg, you know, there are people that know Greg on the festival circuit. He does a lot of TV, uh, but he is the best actor you may not have never heard of Greg Prosser. So, uh, you know, there's a lot, obviously, working with people like John Travolta and, and Daniel Roebuck and Dwayne Whitaker and Natasha Leone and Ernie Borgnine and Benicio Del Toro and some, they're obvious great actors, but there's a lot of actors out there you don't know about. And I love discovering them. I'm actually going to write back someone who said he wants to, one of the two people who reached out to me this week and we'll see if he passes the test about taking the class or, <laughs> well, I'm not interested in the class. Okay. You know, like I just don't understand why you wouldn't want to show an acting instructor, you know, what you can do, why you wouldn't want to get better at your craft, why you wouldn't want to network. Uh, listen, there are people who are busy, like Alex is busy. I know she has a uh, uh, an audition this Saturday. That's fine. But there are people who are not having an audition who don't, you know, and they just want me to put them in a movie and it's just unreal. You know, I knew an actor once who used to reach out to people on Facebook and go, hey, you got to put me in your movie. And I have no doubt that if he hears this, he's going to reach out to you and say, I want to be on your <laughs> on your podcast. But I believe I've told you. So, But no, it's it's funny, but it's not funny. Saying I, I want to, you got to put me in your movie does nothing. You know, you got to, you got to earn the right to be in a movie. You've got to if you don't audition, you got to show someone your work and maybe they like your work. I fell in love with Alex's work. I fell in love with Ke Kevin's work ethic because I hadn't seen his work yet. But the very first conversation with him, I knew he was a serious person. He was willing to quit his job as a movie theater manager and keep talking to me about the career. Like he actually said the words, I'll quit my job right now to keep talking with you. Wow. And anyone who will do that is someone I'll work with. Um, 
you know, and then there are people who don't want to risk anything and want to make it and want to work a steady job. And, and I don't blame them. Maybe they have families. I'm just saying this is a career of risk and you got to go to the edge of defeat to win. And uh, awesome. again, uh, I look at people like Alex and like Kevin and even like uh, uh, Vinny, um, uh, who, who I'm going to be doing a short film with, uh, who, who's someone who should do your podcast. Okay. Um, he, you know, Vinny Velas, he's a very talented actor. And the thing about Vinny is he's got that, I'll do anything. I want to be a complete actor. I want to do drama, comedy, mob. I want to do this. I want to do that. I don't want to just work here. I want to work there. And, you know, I look at Vinny and Kevin and Alex. They're all young actors who are, are up and coming actors, however you want to describe them, who, who, you know, really have that passion and that talent. You got to have the talent and the passion. You can't have one or two. You got, you got to have both. So that's my take on things. Yes. Well, all of your that's information the will be. That's the Samborowski sees it. <laughs> yeah. Your, your information will be in the show description. So no worries about that. I had one question for you. And it, in terms yeah. of the of blind forecasting, is there anything on your radar that could possibly make an Oscar play next year? I know it's oh, early. Blind forecasting. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, I've been concentrating on the Oscars this year. Yes. I know there are people already talking about the movies that are in Sundance. Yes, yes. And uh, that are going to be in Cannes. And we haven't heard a slate for Tribeca. But uh, I, for me, it's too early because okay. I haven't seen them. I've heard a few things, but I don't want to speak out of turn. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you come to me in June or July, I'll probably have some. Uh, a short list for you. Okay, I'll rephrase. Like, not it, only seen, I'll but rephrase. Heard about. <laughs> Are there any productions that you know of that you're looking forward to? Oh, for next year? Yes. Uh, yeah, there's always movies coming out mm -hmm. that uh, that you're you're excited to see. Um, uh, like, one, one of the, the movies like that I would, Phoenix you know, It could Harry actually Potter. be up for... This is the kind of comic book movie, as you know, that could be up for Oscars. Uh Joker. Yes. What I are they calling it? That. Joker. Folio Adu. Yes. Joker. Uh, Folio Adu. Uh, that that you got Lady Gaga yeah. playing, <laughs> you know, um, playing uh, um, um, Harley Quinn. Yes. And, and while I think Margot Robbie was great, it's going to be hard to top it. I love Lady Gaga. You know that. And. <laughs> And Joaquin Phoenix won Best Actor yes, he did. for playing Joker uh, the same way Heath Ledger won uh, Best Supporting Actor for playing Joker. So when when I saw a Joker folio ado and I saw some photos from the set and I read some things. It's that a is musical, though. It's a musical, so before. we'll see. I think it comes out in the fall, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Uh, September, October. And that's the major one that I'm looking forward to. Uh, Daniel Roebuck has another film coming out. I don't know the date called. Um, he's got two actually okay. that he directed. Uh, one called The Hail Mary about a, a football coach, sort of an alcoholic looking for a last lease on life. And he gets the coach again. And um, it, it is a faith-based film, but it's not your traditional faith-based film. Awesome. He's got that. And he's got, uh, he's got another one coming out um, uh, with, um, uh, from Get Shorty, John, uh, I can't believe that I'm, I'm, I'm blanking. Tuesday's no. Flu, and he's got, uh, uh, he played Ronnie in Get Shorty. He was in Napoleon Dynamite. Um, and he's one of my favorite actors, and I couldn't believe he got him. And I am, now that I'm on the spot, and I say his name <laughs> like every day. Uh, Don't worry. I, you, if you think about it. No, no, I'm going to say it right now because. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, okay, okay. Because uh, I can't believe I'm embarrassed. He spells it J O N. Um, okay. Uh, but uh, he he's got he's got a great cast in that movie, uh, and I know uh, one of the people he has. Um, I cannot believe that I um, I blanked on it, but uh, I'll put it in the show notes. You'll think of it after I'll put well, it. Well, last show time notes. I didn't come up with it, and now I'm <laughs> determined to come up with it. Um, <laughs> John Grise, G R I E S. I looked okay. it up. I'm not going to lie, okay. but I know John Grise like his work. I just I don't know. I blanked for a second, but John Grise is in it. You know, um, he's he's got a lot of wonderful talent in it. He's obviously in it. Uh, 
And, uh, you know, I, I think Tuesday's flu, it is not a faith-based film. I know a little bit about it, uh, but it sounds like the kind of movie you just want to go into it blind. Danny directed it. I do not know when it's coming out. It's in editing as we speak, but that's okay. another one that you should look at. And it, he also has Jackie Earl Haley, by the way. Jackie Earl Haley, the mm -hmm. Oscar nominee. He was in Watchmen. He was nominated for Little Children. So, um, you know, um, you know, uh, I, it's, I'm really looking forward to Tuesday's flu. I'm looking forward to the Hail Mary, but I've actually seen it. I saw a rough cut, okay. uh, but I, I haven't seen anything from Tuesday's flu. And I really, so Daniel Roebuck has those two movies coming oh, out. Awesome. And awesome. right now he's got his movie, Lucky Louie, which played in theaters is now streaming. It's on DVD, Blu-ray. Uh, you could get it on Amazon. Uh, the disc, I, I bought the physical disc and I would suggest buying it. Spend the $20. It's a movie you'll yeah. want to watch again. Lucky Louie. It's a faith-based film about a bank heist in the 70s. And this young grad student from Bucknell um, comes and she she was the girl from Getting Grace. Um, uh, Madeline Dundon, she's wonderful. And he's got Dwayne Whitaker. He's got himself. He's got uh, all these wonderful actors in it. Marsha Dietline. Uh, all, all these amazing actors and Basil Hoffman plays the lead and, and Basil Hoffman's a career actor who was in night shift, who was in you um, um, catch me if you can major movies, but this, he played supporting characters. This was his first lead and he passed about a year before a year after the film was completed before it came out, but he and see it it's called lucky Louie. You can get it streaming, but I would buy the physical disc. And if you like it, leave a review on IMDb and Amazon. Not if you don't like it. Don't do that to Danny. But if you think it's a five-star movie, then give it that review. It's because we got to support independent films, and it's a great film. Again, I have the DVD. Uh, I, you know, I, I own it, and uh, it's actually in my player right now because uh, I just watched it the day I got it. So uh, lucky, Louie. But yes, in addition to Danny's two movies, Tuesday's Flu, and uh, and the Hail Mary. I'm really looking forward to Joker Folio Adu. Oh, cool. The great so lady. Speak Gaga. Yes. Speaking of DVDs, you were supposed to send me, sir. I have it. It's uh, sitting right here. DVD for your documentary, Creature It's sitting Feature. right here. I actually opened up the cellophane. So I, I got a silver Sharpie. I promise you, I'm going to autograph it and get it out. I'll try to get it out within the week. There, there are okay. extenuating circumstances. All right, I, I totally understand, but I've been waiting patiently. I have it. I actually have it for you. <laughs> All right, awesome. <laughs> and then you're gonna have to watch it, and then maybe we'll do a show about that in the spring. Oh, that'll be great. Because this is the 70th anniversary of Creature. They're coming out with a comic book. All this oh, stuff. Neat. And maybe, maybe the date of release weekend or right after. That'll be like April, May. Uh, we'll do a show on the creature, my doc, and just the 70th anniversary of the character. And oh, yeah, I, I'll tell you this, they call Jaws the original summer blockbuster. That's not true. Creature from the Black Lagoon is. And when you oh, watch yeah. the doc, you'll know. Oh, yeah. We and I love Jaws, too. One of my 10 favorite movies of all time, as is Creature. But Creature from the Black Lagoon is the original, uh, you know, summer blockbuster. And I think on that... There's nothing left for me to say, but God yeah. bless you. Stay fresh. And stay fresh. All right. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you. You were listening to Journaling with PT and an entry devoted to predicting the Oscars with my co-host, Mr. Sam Borowski. His information is in the show notes. Follow the podcast, subscribe, share with your friends. Thank you so much if you were listening all the way to the end. You're awesome and you rock. The beautiful music, the new theme music for the German PT podcast, is by the multi-talented composer Zendo Gemell. The 
name of the piece in cello and classical guitar is Preludio. Please take care and stay tuned.